Hi, I'm Jackie Baker, um, at one of the editors at New Mandala. I'm here sitting with uh, Professor Hal Hill and uh, Dr. Arianta Patunru, and we're going to talk today about the ec some of the economic and policy challenges that Jaco a new Jokowi government might face. So thank you so much for joining us today. Mm, thank um, Thanks, Jackie. Uh, my first question would be, the last two surveys of recent developments in the Bulletin of Indonesian Studies suggested that there's not a lot of fiscal wiggle room for the new Jokowi government. And why is that and what are the economic and financial challenges that a Jokowi government might face? Uh, well, that's true. There isn't a lot of wiggle room and this is um, a new administration uh, which has got a lot of spending pledges and of course the alternative candidate, uh, Prabowo Subianto, had even more p uh, spending pledges. Uh, Indonesia's had this remarkable fiscal consolidation since the Asian financial crisis. Uh, at the end of the Asian financial crisis, its public finances were in tatters. Uh, public debt to GDP was about 100%. Now it's down to the mid-20s. So it's been a remarkable achievement. However, the government has very little room to move for, for several reasons. One is its tax effort isn't all that strong. So on the revenue side, it's hemmed in. And then a lot of its expenditure is also pre-allocated or pre-committed. So the major items, for example, this, uh, this subsidy issue which has bedeviled uh, successive administrations, it's now a huge part of the budget, uh, almost 4% of GDP, highly in inequitable and highly inefficient. That's one part of it. Another part is the commitment uh, in the Constitution now to spend 20% of the budget on education, which of course is good, but yeah. it's also pre-allocating. And then a lot of the budget also goes out automatically to the, uh, to the regions, mainly to the Kabul Patan and Kodamadja, under an automatic uh, revenue sharing formula. So uh, for all those reasons, the, the leeway is really limited. In addition, Indonesia has a fiscal law which says that the government should not run deficits of more than 3% of GDP. It's already very close to that 3% limit. Mm. And so it's got, it's got even less room to borrow, uh, to, to, to spend. One final point, uh, there's also still a kind of anti-borrowing uh, syndrome mm. in Indonesia, which is understandable. It's a result of the Asian financial crisis when Indonesia got badly affected by financial markets. And therefore, there's a lot of understandable hesitation about borrowing, even at very low interest rates for long-term infrastructure projects. Mm. But uh, so I think uh, yeah, Pajar might to like to... Just emphasize what Haas uh, has been mentioning, so there has to be three things at least uh, to be done. The first one is to reduce the subsidy, so especially if you subsidy that already amounted to almost 250 trillion. Yeah. And uh, that's the first one. The second, re reallocate. Uh, of course, there is not s too uh, much space uh, in reallocation, uh, reallocating the, the items, but you know, uh, putting more on uh, allocation for infrastructure, for example, poverty eradication, as opposed to putting more and more on, on subsidy, I think is a must. And the third one is uh, probably the government should think again about uh, borrowing. Mm. Yeah. Um, what has Jokowi said that his policy priorities are, and can he afford them? That's a good question because uh, many of uh, what he promised actually involve, you know, uh, more and more money the allocation to each village and then, uh, you know, uh, these kilometers of off road and everything. So all this, I think, can be done. But the first thing that need to be done, uh, necessary condition for this, is the three things that I, I mentioned. Mm. What is to be done with the the the, the budget mm -hmm. uh, structure and also fuel subsidy. Mm -hmm. In some ways, Indonesia now is not unlike Australia now, in the sense that we both enjoyed this massive commodity boom, you know, driven by China mm, right. uh, over the past decade. And in the last two or three years, commodity prices have fallen a lot. Mm. And we've still got budgets which are operating on the assumption that we still have high commodity prices. So just as in Australia there's a debate going on about this sort of so-called structural budget deficit, that is we're kind of spending as though we still had the revenue from the commodity boom per period, Indonesia is a little bit like that too. It's, mm. it's also a commodity exporter 
and it's 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 now having to adjust um, it's now having to adjust to these lower commodity prices which mean lower government revenue but the political rhetoric is still in the era of you know commodity boom and and as we saw in the election uh, this year in Indonesia like we saw in the election in Australia last year yeah. um, no one really in that political rhetoric kind of address some of the harder questions of how do we adjust yeah I mean do you see that having political implications for in the short term for a new Jokowi government um, yes and no. Uh, I think uh, the the political uh, uh, implication, of course, he has to deal with uh, DPR, the House, and in, for example, when now if he wants to raise the uh, the fuel price, for example, it's okay without uh, uh, House approval. But sometimes when when on, like in, in in the past, if you raise the the, the fuel price, you might want to. Uh, accommodate with the compens compensation and compensation you have to consult with DPR so there's this you know uh, discussion has to be going on with uh, between Jokowi and his cabinet with, and, and the president and of course many of this also is subject to the cabinet of mm. course and then how mm. cabinet uh, members will, uh, will be able to talk with, uh, with the DPR and other political parties. Mm. And I, I suppose in turn we don't really know who are going to be the key economic policy makers still don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. in a Jacobi right. administration? I mean, lots of lots of, yeah. lots of rumours, but um, at least you would you would say that um, that SBY as president appointed you know very competent uh, right. technocrats. The two key positions are really the finance uh, ministry, which of course is mm -hmm. held by an ANU PhD, <laughs> uh, and, and 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 the governor of the central bank, and those two two key appointments during right. the. SPY period. The 10 years have been, you know, very competent people. But even with very competent people, mm. uh, SPY found it too difficult to do it. Right. Now, with this new administration where we don't know who's going to be in these key positions, yeah. uh, in, yeah. could be inexperienced. So there could be a, a real learning period of a year or two, in addition to the points right. that Archer mentioned of working with the, this Rainbow Cabinet and this right. Parliament. Uh, there yeah. could be just the technical bit yeah. of getting it through the the cabinet through the key positions. Right. Yeah, in addition to those two positions, uh, Minister of Finance and Bank Indonesia, I think one key key position is also Trade Ministry, and mm -hmm. I think that's very important, especially mm -hmm. now that Indonesia is engaging with uh, all this uh, regional and international uh, trade forum. And what is missing, basically, what has been missed from from the campaign, for example, is um, uh, the clear uh, direction as to. Uh, how trade policy is going to be in, in mm. Jokowi's uh, uh, presidency. And I think it's important because just, you know, recently we have seen so many uh, policies that leads to protectionism so or resource nationalism, and it's not very good for, for the economy. So it's really important to have a uh, good uh, trade minister. And, and I, yeah. I suppose in turn, um, Atro, that leads to a more general observation, isn't it? Which is we know that from Indonesian experience, and again, Australia is not unlike it, that when you get a commodity boom, you tend to get a resurgence of economic nationalism. You know, mm. people think right. there's plenty of money. We don't need to worry about what foreigners think. We don't need their money. We've got our own money. And so there's a very clear correlation historically in Indonesia between periods of very high commodity prices and this sort of this economic nationalism. Right. Right. And in the past, when the commodity prices have fallen quite sharply, uh, that's when the, the sort of political economy realignments change. Um, you know, uh, presidents need kind of technocratic advice, and so the economists often become more important. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that happened very clearly un in, under Suharto, a couple of occasions in the big crises right. of the mid-60s, mid-80s, and then there was recovery. The question now is, and that's been written about a lot, we know the political economy story of how the technocrats became more important when economic circumstances became more challenging. Yeah. The question now is, will that old formula, mm. which in Indonesia was often called Sudley's Law, you know, bad times Thank make good policies, mm. right. will that formula still work in this new political economy constellation? And I don't think well, we, we know the answer we yet. We don't know, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting because right. uh, Eve Warburton just wrote for East Asia Forum suggesting that economic uh, resource nationalism right. would, would is a fixture now in the yeah. uh, mm. Indonesian political landscape. Mm. Right. But uh, you're suggesting that that may not be able to hold? Well, I would expect that 
President Jokowi will become more pragmatic mm. when he right. is uh, mm. he became officially uh, become uh, president, uh, m more pragmatic than what he appeared in the com campaign, for mm. example. Why? Because he just needs to do that. I mm. mean, uh, the first thing, of course, he would do uh, when he become a, a officially uh, become the president is to look at the budget and well, it's not enough, and then. After that, they, he has to engage with the international uh, um, a part, uh, uh, you know, like uh, after his uh, uh, appointment, of course, there are two international uh, activities that he has to engage with. Uh, the first one is uh, APEC uh, mm -hmm. in Beijing, mm. uh, and then uh, uh, G20 here in, in, in Brisbane. And, and this also relates to how Indonesia uh, deals with uh, foreign uh, uh, trade policy and as you said you know this issue about uh, resource, nationali resource nationalism has been uh, appearing in the surface and I think uh, President Jokowi will realize that uh, he needs to make some adjustment you know, mm -hmm. more pragmatically. You know. Yeah and, and if I could just add there yeah. I, I think yes. the appointment of the trade minister as uh, Acho mentions is really important yeah. Yeah. So, um, and Indonesian trade policy has swung quite a lot depending on who that minister is. Yeah. So for the first uh, term of SBY and about half of the second term, we had, Indonesia had a very competent trade minister, very well known, of course an ANU graduate as well, Dr. Mari Pangestu, yeah. and she held the line on this protectionist pressures. But before her uh, was um, uh, Rini Suwandi, who is now of course, um, running the transition team of mm. of um, of Jokowi yeah. and Rini as trade minister was you know was pretty protectionist and mm. subsequent to Maori being uh, moved to tourism and creative economy uh, there have been there have been two ministers uh, um, Mr Gita and Mr Lutfi and they've both been they've talked globalization but they've both been pretty protectionist right. um, and so Mari's period was the exception, in a way, to the right. period before, before and after her. So the choice of trade minister, I just wanted to underline the point that Atro made, the choice of trade minister is very important. One other little point to keep in mind also is that in December next year, the ASEAN economic community mm. takes yeah, effect. Right. Yeah. And in principle, at least, it's going to just be a bit harder to get all these um, trade policy interventions through because... Um, they, Indonesia will be subject to the inspection from its, um, its ASEAN member countries. And there are some very open economies in ASEAN, like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, right. who will be looking at Indonesia. So right. some, of our, some of our technocrat friends in Indonesia now say probably the only real buttress against this trend towards protections may in fact be the regional commitments. Wow, fascinating. Well, thank you very much, General, for coming in today. Thank um, you. We really thank appreciate you. your contribution. Mm. Thanks again. Thanks very thank much, you. Jackie. Yes.